when you go to public spaces like stadiums or airports or train stations, you'll see boxes uh, with glass, almost like a break glass in, ca in case of emergency, which contain portable defibrillators. Uh, and that's meant to resuscitate those folks who, uh, for whatever reason, uh, experience uh, uh, a cardiac arrhythmia that results in them losing consciousness, collapsing, uh, and in many of those circumstances they are easily or re easily resuscitated with prompt defibrillatory shocks delivered by those devices. What we try to do is prevent them though and try to identify those folks who are at risk of dying suddenly. And to do that, um, we largely look at things like uh, their overall cardiac health, and other comorbid illnesses uh, to get a sense of what their risk might be. And in folks that we deem particularly high risk, we implant them with an uh, implantable defibrillator. Uh, my role generally is, is, although I do implant defibrillators, it, it comes in after the fact, after the defibrillator's been implanted and they begin to experience uh, electrical storm with those defibrillators already in place. What we really refer to as electrical storm are those folks who have implantable defibrillators, which are implanted to prevent sudden death. And when people have appropriate therapies, uh, meaning defibrillator shocks or defibrillator therapies, which total a number of three or more in 24 hours, we define that as electrical storm. Um, and in that setting, when people experience multiple defibrillator shocks or therapies, which can in and of themselves be predictive, of worsening cardiac condition, worsened outcomes, meaning higher morbidity and mortality from a cardiovascular standpoint, we intervene with things like catheter ablation to reduce uh, the risk of, of sudden death. So VT ablation um, is firstly not a cure. Uh, in folks who have idiopathic ventricular arrhythmias, the procedure can be cured if it can eliminate the focus or the hot spot where those arrhythmias emanate from. And that's very different from people who have advanced structural heart disease or the heart is diseased for other reasons. And the electrical problems, the arrhythmias, are a manifestation of the underlying uh, cardiac disease. When we ablate arrhythmias in the setting of structural heart disease, we are not curing or reversing the underlying cardiac disease or what we call cardiomyopathy, okay? What we are doing is essentially suppressing or containing we're managing the, the electrical manifestations. It's not unlike trying to treat cancer in which we're not necessarily trying to cure, but we're trying to contain or control the disease. When we ablate ventricular arrhythmias in the setting of structural heart disease, we are containing or we are controlling. Now, the success rates are, are better than doing nothing. Uh, and it depends on what kind of substrate we're talking about, but in the, let's say in the setting of people who've had prior myocardial infarction or prior heart attack where they've had an occlusion acutely of a coronary artery and part of the heart muscle dies as a consequence, and then over time the heart muscle heals and forms scar in the area that was damaged. And ablating ventricular arrhythmias that result from that, where the, the, the scar itself is interdigitated with surviving bundles of cardiac myocytes, those surviving bundles become the nidus or the source of circuits for those electrical arrhythmias or those ventricular arrhythmias. And a catheter ablation simply goes in and finds those surviving bundles of myocytes and begins to burn or cauterize them to eliminate them. And in doing that, the success rates can approach 70% um, with improved morbidity and mortality. In the late 1990s, um, a company called Biosense Webster, which is an Israeli company, uh, first developed uh, 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 magnetic navigation where systems were uh, created to basically create a GPS system for the heart where catheters were fitted with magnetic sensors and patches were placed on the body. And it's kind of like uh, having a GPS in your car and you can drive around and the satellites above you will give you your precise location on Earth. And um, those patches on the body serve as those satellites kind of orbiting the earth and the catheter itself is like the car driving in your, in your heart. And um, St. Jude Medical then developed a, a similar system, a little bit different, um, a little bit different technology. Um, but very soon um, there'll be a, a newer system that comes out called Precision. 
the first week of January. We will be one of 12 sites in the United States um, that will have it. Um, and what these three-dimensional mapping systems have done uh, have enabled us to eliminate the need or re significantly reduce the need for x-ray equipment to image catheters in the body. And coupled with that, what it's done is it has enabled us to look at things like voltages inside the heart muscle, which can be a surrogate for tissue health and help us navigate to the diseased areas of heart muscle to focus our attention and to focus our ablation uh, efforts. Additionally, um, it allows us to see electrical signals in the heart themselves and to get a sense of how the heart is activating itself, how the electrical uh, conduction system of the heart, the specialized conduction system of the heart is working and transmitting signals through the heart muscle. Uh, and it allows us to map arrhythmias in real time to get a sense of how those wave fronts of activation are traveling through the heart muscle. And there are some new concepts emerging um, that uh, will better enable us to map these arrhythmias uh, in real time with uh, while limiting um, the exposure to those r rapid arrhythmias, which in many cases are not mappable, because when they happen, they're fast, the patient's blood pressure drops, and they are electrically and hemodynamically unstable. And um, we are really at a point where um, we are beginning to be, be able to map in high resolution three dimensions uh, and uh, reduce the need for mapping in the arrhythmia to make the procedure safer. And so we've really, from the advent of these mapping systems to now have created, are beginning to create workflows that maximize uh, patient safety, reduce risk, enhance outcomes, and improve uh, long-term survival from these arrhythmias. And so it's really a very exciting time uh, for us uh, to be uh, in this field, and I think I came to MUSC at the right time. I joined a, a, an already very mature group uh, at a very busy center for managing arrhythmias, and um, I think all the credit goes to uh, the folks that have been here already. And Dr. Gold um, is uh, a the former now chair, chief of cardiology at MUSC. Uh, and, but he is now the, currently the president of the Heart Rhythm Society, which is a, a national and global society for heart rhythm uh, professionals, um, not just physicians, but uh, support staff and uh, allied professionals. Uh, and he is right here at MUSC and is the president of the Heart Rhythm Society. Marcus Wharton is um, a very well regarded and one of the, the senior kind of uh, members of the Heart Rhythm Society who began. Uh, was one of the pioneers of AFib ablation in the United States, and he's here. Um, Frank Kuoko is my partner and um, has really grown sort of the ablation practice around the state of South Carolina, has made MUSC as center of excellence and a, a referral center for complex uh, atrial arrhythmia management. And then Lacey Sturdivant has been here uh, as well and is a, a, a really very talented electrophysiologist and is um, one of our, our, our lead extractionists. For me, um, the you know, managing ventricular arrhythmias requires a multidisciplinary team. It's not just a physician operator, but it's first and foremost, it's the lab staff that we have that are very experienced and very dedicated uh, and are among the most capable people uh, I've worked with anywhere between Boston and Chicago and now here. They're tremendous. Um, we have to have world-class cardiac anesthesia, which we have hemodynamic support in the form of heart failure and interventional catheter or interventional cardiologists, which we have. We've been able to do um, some fairly advanced and sophisticated cases with advanced hemodynamic support uh, because we have the expertise already in place here. And then uh, the advanced heart failure group here, uh, the signal to me that this place was moving in a direction where it was serious about managing ventricular arrhythmias is when they brought in uh, Tom DeSalvo to be the chief of cardiology, who is an advanced heart failure uh, cardiologist recruited from Vanderbilt, familiar in the heart fa failure and transplant uh, arena, and knows about ventricular cyst devices and other forms of he advanced hemodynamic support and cardiac transplantation. We need that because uh, that is really um, 
an extension of what we do. And, and really, I would say it's the other way around. It's not just managing ventricular arrhythmias. It's really a VT ablation program is a part of a overall program in advanced heart disease, which includes VT ablation, surgeons to implant ventricular assist devices, to perform cardiac transplantations, heart failure transplant cardiologists, imaging cardiologists, cardiac anesthesiologists, all of it. It's a team approach, and we cannot do what we do without all of those pieces in place, and we have that here.